This is lecture six for biology 177, focusing on vision and the eyes. As we work our way through the eye, we're gonna start first with some of the more superficial gross structures and then work through the internal structures and focus on the physiology of the eye. We'll start with some of the accessory structures of the eye, looking at the external structure known as the eyelids or the palpebrae. These are simply a continuation of the skin or integument, and the, the continual blinking of the eyelids helps to keep the surface lubricated and removes dust and debris. It also can close firmly over to protect the eye. You do not need eyelids in order to sleep, but it does make it a lot easier to block out light and to fall asleep faster. This is a grilled short rib sandwich with some cheese on it, almost like a patty melt. Mmm, very savory. From the eyelids, we actually move into the internal structure of between the eyelids and the actual eye itself. And here we have a thin stratified squamous epithelium called the conjunctiva. This will cover the inner surface of the eyelids and the, so the inner surface of the eyelids, which would be the palpable conjunctiva, and then the surface of the eye, which would be the ocular conjunctiva. They meet up and create a pocket called a fornix. Here we can see the conjunctiva as it comes down from the palpebrae. We can see the palpebral conjunctiva and the ocular conjunctiva as they meet up at the fornix. Conjunctivitis is a reddening of the conjunctiva due to dilation of blood vessels. This can be caused by an infection, more commonly known of as pink eye, or by any number of physical, chemical, or allergic responses. Even staring at a computer or TV for too long can cause this. Eyelashes are long, thick hairs that emerge from the palpable margins. Their function is to prevent foreign matter, such as dust or insects, from reaching the eye. The root hair plexus is going to trigger the blink response when stimulated. And deep inside that hair plexus is going to be a tarsal gland that secretes a waxy sebum. This helps to keep the eyelashes separate from each other. Now, if a tarsal gland becomes blocked, a buildup of secretions can cause a swelling. This is pronounced chalazin. A chalazin is that blocked tarsal gland. Now this is quite different from a sty, which is a swollen pimple on the eyelid caused by a bacterial infection. Here we can see the difference between a sty and a chalazin. Now we get to move into the actual lacrimal apparatus. These are gonna be actually what produce tears. The lacrimal apparatus consists of the gland itself, which is going to be in the upper right portion of the occipital margin and is going to produce approximately one milliliter of watery tears per day. Tears are actually very important. They lubricate and nourish and oxygenate the corneal cells since these corneal cells have no blood vessels. They also help to attack pathogens and keep the eye clean, making sure that there are different antibodies and enzymes that are present in these tears. Of course, tears are also stimulated in abundance when you have an emotional response or an allergic reaction. Tear ducts are going to carry the tears from the lacrimal gland out to the upper eyelid, forming the lacrimal lake. From there, we move into the lacrimal puncta, two small pores that drain the lacrimal lake. Tears will then move across the eye towards the corner of the eye where it gets to the lacrimal caniculi. Here, small canals are connecting the lacrimal puncta to the lacrimal sac. The lacrimal sac is going to be a small chamber nestled in the lacrimal sulcus of the orbit and then drain to the nasolacrimal duct, which will actually drain out the tears through the nasal cavity. Here we can actually take a look at all of those structures. We're gonna start in the upper corner of the eye, in this case, the upper right corner of the eye, where the lacrimal gland is. This is where tears are produced. They then move down the tear ducts and into the actual eye where it will go across. So tears are produced in the upper corner of the eye, drain across the eye to the corner of the eye. This is where you typically will have tears fall down or build up over time as they start to drain. It drains via the lacrimal puncta to the lacrimal caniculi to the sac 
and then to the nasolacrimal duct. And this is why your nose runs when you're crying. The ability to move the eye is controlled by six extraocular eye muscles. They are innervated by three separate cranial nerves. The superior rectus, inferior rectus, medial rectus, and inferior oblique are innervated by cranial nerve three, the oculomotor nerve. The superior oblique is innervated by cranial nerve four, or the trochlear nerve, and the lateral rectus is innervated by cranial nerve six, or the abducens. The superior rectus is going to rotate the eye up, the inferior rectus rotates the eye down, the medial rectus is going to rotate the eye medially or adduct the eye. The lateral rectus is going to abduct the eye or rotate it laterally. And the superior oblique is going to allow two movements. It depresses and abducts the eye at an angle. And the inferior oblique is going to elevate and abduct the eye. Now that we've covered the accessory structures of the eye, we can start to focus on the eye itself and specifically starting with the different layers. Here, the layers are organized from superficial to deep. Remember that the eye itself is a large sphere or orb. And so as we go deeper into the core of the eye, this is deep and on the surface of the eye is superficial. The fibrous tunic will be the most superficial layer of the eye and consists of the sclera and the cornea. The vascular tunic is the next deep layer. This is going to contain different blood vessels, lymph vessels, and intrinsic eye muscles, as well as the iris, ciliary body, and choroid. The final layer is the retina, sometimes referred to as the neural tunic. This is going to contain the pigmented layer in the neural layer and many of the functional aspects of the eye that interpret light. We'll start with the fibrous tunic, which is the outermost superficial layer and probably the simplest layer of the eye. Its functions are to support and protect the eye, serve as an attachment site for extrinsic eye muscles, and the curvature of the cornea is going to aid in focusing light into the lens. The fibrous tunic itself consists of the cornea, which is the clear portion over the front of the eye, and then the rest of the eye, which is the sclera or the white of the eye. The cornea is a fascinating structure. It is a clear, transparent layer that has a dense matrix of multiple layers of collagen fibers. They are organized in such a way that they don't interfere with light passage. The cornea itself is an avascular structure, and so there are no blood vessels to interfere with light passage. You can imagine if there were actually blood vessels in the cornea, we'd be looking through a web of blood every single time we look at something. So that's why it's important that it is avascular. So because of this, it receives oxygen and nutrients from tears, which is why we generate tears throughout the day. Looking at the histology of the cornea, we can see those cleanly organized collagen fibers that allow us to be able to see very readily. Remember that the cornea is avascular. This means that there are no blood vessels in it. And because of that, we can actually transplant cornea from one person to the other without fear of rejection because tissue typing doesn't matter when it's avascular. This also means that we've had a lot of recent progress in xenotransplantation, where we actually pull cornea from pigs and transplant them to a human. You can see the stitching pattern around the eye that uses protein fibers that will eventually dissolve in order to affix the cornea to the new host. Now the next deepest layer in the eye is the vascular tunic. This contains many blood vessels, lymphatic vessels, as well as the intrinsic smooth muscles of the eye that help to control the lens and the pupil. The functions of the vascular tunic include providing a route for blood vessels and lymphatics to supply eye tissue, regulating the amount of light entering the eye, secreting and reabsorbing aqueous humor, which is a fluid that circulates in the anterior part of the eye chambers, and controlling the shape of the lens, which is an essential part in the focusing process. There are three major components of the vascular tunic. The first part is the iris. The iris is the colored part of the eye. Now, eye color is determined by genes that influence the density and distribution of melanocytes, which are the pigment cells that are also found in skin. If you have just a few melanocytes, you get a light reaching the pigment layer and bouncing off of it, and you get blue eyes. 
If you have many melanocytes of different quantities, you could get green, brown, hazel, or even black eyes. And in some cases, you have no pigment at all. This is albinism. And this is where you have a pale gray or blue gray eyes. And in some cases, pink, where the blood vessels show through beyond any form of the actual eye itself. The iris is going to also contain blood vessels, pigment cells, and layers of smooth muscle fibers. The contraction of these muscle fibers changes the diameter of the pupil. We have two major smooth muscles inside the iris, the pupillary constrictor muscle and the pupillary dilator muscle. Now, the pupillary dilator muscle is going to dilate the eye and make the pupil larger. This happens when we have decreased light intensity or increased sympathetic stimulation. When we need to let more light in the eye, we dilate it. Now, the, uh, the constrictor works when we have increased light intensity or increased parasympathetic stimulation, when we want less light in the eye. Besides the iris, the other two major components of the vascular tunic are the ciliary body and the choroid. The ciliary body itself consists of the ciliary muscle, the ciliary processes, and the suspensory ligaments. These are going to hold the lens in place while the ciliary processes also secrete aqueous humor. The ciliary muscle and ciliary body in general, all of this structure, is going to be involved in changing the shape of the lens. The choroid is a vascular layer covered by the sclera and has an extensive capillary network. It is designed to deliver oxygen and nutrients to the neural tissue of the neural layer. Here we can see the anterior chamber of the eye, including the ciliary body. You can see the lens as it is attached via suspensory ligaments to the ciliary processes. The ciliary processes are going to be extensions of the ciliary muscle. The muscle when it contracts or when it relaxes is going to change the shape of the lens. From the ciliary processes, aqueous humor is secreted. And this is designed to keep the eye, the cornea in that curved shape. And it gets drained out as you can see just to the side of the cornea and reabsorbed back into the system. Now the lens is about the size of a warhead candy and about the same kind of texture. It is posterior to the cornea and held in place by suspensory ligaments of the ciliary body. It has the texture and clearness that it does because of transparent proteins called crystallins. This gives the lens its clarity and focusing power. The function of the lens is to focus a visual image on the photoreceptors by changing shape. When the suspensory ligaments are engaged, pulling on it, it's going to resist the tendency of the lens to assume a spherical shape. Naturally, at rest, the lens wants to be more spherical. When the suspensory ligaments are pulling on the actual lens, it will become flatter. Now we're into the final layer, the neural tunic. This is where light that passes through the lens is transformed into a nerve signal that is processed into a visual image. It consists of an outer pigmented layer that is attached to the choroid. This pigmented layer is very dark and absorbs light, protects and nourishes the neural layer. It connects the blood vessels from the choroid down deeper. Then there's the thick neural layer the thick neural part of the neural tunic that contains photoreceptors, which are going to be specialized receptor cells that are sensitive to light and transmit that in information to different bipolar neurons and then finally to ganglion cells. Photoreceptors, when they're clustered together, form what is called the maculae or spot, otherwise known as the maculae luteae. This is the area with the highest concentration of photoreceptors on the back part of the retina. The central of layer or the central area, the single dot of the macula is called the fovea. This is also a shallow depression and it is the point of sharpest vision where there are the most amount of photoreceptors in the center of the macula. Opposite to this is the optic disc. This is actually gonna be where we have a blind spot. It's where the optic nerve exits the retina and because the optic nerve has to exit the retina at a point, this means that there are no photoreceptors where the optic nerve is. 
Here we can see the back part of the eye, the retina, and a sample of where the macula would be, and then the fovea at the center of the macula. You can also take note of the optic disc, which can be easily found because this is where all the blood vessels of the eye also come out as well, and where the optic nerve is, remembering this is the blind spot. The eye can also be broken up into two cavities. The anterior cavity, which extends from the cornea to the lens and is filled with the aqueous humor, and the posterior cavity, which is the main volume of the eye and is everything beyond the actual lens. This is going to be filled with the gelatinous vitreous body, which is composed of the vitreous humor as well as a gelatin compound. The vitreous body does not regenerate, but the aqueous humor does. Here we can see the separation of the anterior chamber that's going to actually be filled with aqueous humor and runs from the cornea to the lens, and then the posterior cavity or the vitreous chamber, which would house the vitreous body, which is very gel-like. Now we'll talk about the actual physiology of vision, specifically how we focus light and how we see. Focusing light is a two-step process. First, light is going to be refracted, which means it's bent. This is where it passes from air into the cornea and then into the lens. This works in the same way that light is bent via a prism and separated out into its different light wave frequencies. In nature, when it actually hits raindrops, prisms, this is going to cause it to break up into the different light spectrums and we see a rainbow. Now the amount of bending or refraction at the cornea is not variable, it's constant. Light is refracted again as it passes from the aqueous humor into the lens. From that refraction point, it is then focused onto the retina by changing shape. The focal distance of the lens is quite simply the distance from the center of a lens to its focal point. A focal point is the point that you can focus on. This is determined by the distance from the object to the lens and the shape of the lens. The focusing by changing the shape of the lens is a process that is called accommodation. So it's changing the shape to be able to see something. Accommodation has two ways that it works, for close vision and for far vision. For close vision, the ciliary muscle is going to contract. This contraction reduces the tension on the suspensory ligaments and the lens becomes more spherical. This allows us to focus on nearby objects as light bends more. This near point of vision is the inner limit of clear vision, and it is determined by the degree of elasticity in the lens. The near point for vision is actually going to increase with age as the lens becomes less elastic. In children, our near point is three to four inches, and in young adults, it's six to 98. And then by age 60, it increases to about 33 inches. That's typically why we need reading glasses when we get older. Now for distant vision, distant vision, it's going to actually be the opposite. Here, the ciliary muscle is going to relax and an increased tension on the suspensory ligaments pulls at the circumference of the lens and the lens becomes flatter. This allows us to be able to focus on more distant objects. Here we can see an example of close vision and far vision. In the far vision or distant vision, the ciliary muscle is relaxed and the lens is flattened. In close vision, the ciliary muscle is contracted and the lens is rounded. So that way we can focus that light on the fovea to be able to see. Now, when actually forming the image, the image itself is not just a single point. Even though the diagram in the previous slide showed it as a point, it is actually a large number of individual points. We see things very much the same way that a computer screen works, with pixels on a computer screen. And we simply invert and reverse the actual image. So light from each point is focused on the retina and because of refraction through the lens, the full image is inverted and in reverse. The brain compensates for this image reversal and we learn this through experience. So we are actually getting the image on the back of our eye inverted and reversed and our brain corrects it immediately, allowing us to see everything in an upright posture. 
Now there are two conditions associated with nearsightedness and then another, well, excuse me, uh, condition associated with nearsightedness and then another condition associated with farsightedness. Myopia is nearsightedness. This is characterized by a focal distance that is too short and we can't focus on distant objects. Here we use a diverging or concave lens to spread light rays apart. Hyperopia is farsightedness. The focal distance is too long. We're better at focusing on distant objects and we use a convergent or convex lens to bend light rays more onto the retina. So once we focus the light onto the back of the eye, we get to the retina and the pigmented part of the retina. The pigmented part of the retina absorbs light that passes through the neural part and prevents light from bouncing back, producing any kind of visual echo. So it's very, very dark. The cells have important biochemical interactions with the photoreceptors in the neural part here. So what's going to happen is light will actually go all the way through to the back of the eye where the pigmented part of the retina is. So it's actually, because it's light, it can pass through a lot of other cells without interacting with it. The pigmented part of the eye is going to actually grab that light and then transmit it to the photoreceptors, which will then move through the neural part of the retina to the bipolar cells and then to the ganglion cells as it transmits that information to the optic nerve. Now the neural part of the retina contains photoreceptors, supporting cells and neurons. It performs preliminary processing and integration of the visual information and the outermost layer is going to contain photoreceptors. The innermost layer is formed by ganglion cells. These are axons of these cells that converge at the optic disc to form the optic nerve. The optic nerve where it enters is also called the blind spot. Remember, this is because it lacks photoreceptors. Photoreceptors come in two types, rods, which are the most numerous, and they're very sensitive to dim light. They have no discrimination among colors and their density increases towards the periphery of the retina. This allows us to see changes in light variation at our periphery. Cones provide us with color vision. The easy way to remember the difference between these, between rods and cones, is cones C for color. These are gonna give sharper, clearer images than rods and require more intense light. They are less numerous and denser closer to the fovea. Rods and cones are going to synapse with bipolar cells and the bipolar cells synapse on ganglion cells. You have additional support cells like the amacrine and horizontal cells that will help with the processing of visual images and adjusting to different light levels. Here we can see an excellent diagram of the actual neural part of the retina where we can see the direction that light would go in. So light is going to go in, in through that arrow and it will hit the back of where the pigmented part of the retina is. Then information will travel from the pigmented part of the retina through the photoreceptors, to the bipolar cells, and then to the ganglion cells. Horizontal cells and amacrine sh cells shown here are gonna simply help with the processing of the image. We can also see the difference between the rods and cones, the rods being long and slender, and the cones being a little shorter, fatter, and having a more cone-like shape at the top. Photoreceptors have three distinct regions. The pigmented epithelium, which is going to absorb excess photons. Remember, photons are simply light particles. And they're going to phagocytize old discs and shed from the tip of the outer segment. Photoreceptor discs are actually continually replaced to allow us to be able to see. We'll talk about that in a little bit. From the pigmented epithelium, we have the outer segment. This will contain discs with visual pigments. And then we have the inner segment. This is going to have most of the other major organelles that we know of in a cell and is responsible for all cell functions other than the detection of light known as photoreception. Each photoreceptor is going to synapse with a bipolar cell. Here we can actually see a zoom in on a cone and a pair of rods and the actual synapsing of the pigmented epithelium to the outer segment, which would consist of all of the different cones, and then into the inner segment, which is the normal cell function. 
remember that those photoreceptors within synapse with the bipolar cell. And here again, we can see the light as it actually moves through here. Here we can see the differences between rods and cones as it's on the back part of the retina and where they attach directly to the pigmented layer. This is another really good view of the rods and cones and the different layers that separate them. We can see how densely packed they are throughout. Now, photoreceptors serve the basic function of detecting photons, which are the units of light, light particles. To do this, photoreceptors contain visual pigments that transduce light. This, these visual pigments are derivatives of a compound called rhodopsin. Rhodopsin is simply visual pigment. This consists of opsin, which is a protein that determines the wavelength of absorption of pigment, and retinol, which is a pigment that is synthesized from vitamin A. So it's this pro uh, these two different protein pigments that are mixed together. So inside the discs of the actual photoreceptors are going to be the rhodopsin molecules. And we can see it here, the retinol with the opsin where it's fused throughout the cell membrane. Remember that this is actually going to aid in the absorption of light and changes the pigment shape. So color vision is determined by the cones. Rods all contain the same type of opsin, and so they can't distinguish between colors. However, in cones, each type comes with a different form of opsin that are sensitive to different wavelengths of light. So there are three different types of opsin that actually are going to determine how it's going to process the light. Can it process blue, green, or red? There's a combined differential stimulation that allows the brain to discern different colors. If all are stimulated equally, we know this is white. Now in a resting state in the dark, the photoreceptor is continually releasing neurotransmitters across the synapse of the bipolar cells. Once we have exposure to light, the rhodopsin will absorb the photons and changing its shape. The photoreceptor the photoreceptor is going to then decrease the rate of neurotransmitter release by hyperpolarizing. This decreasing rate signals the bipolar cell that the photoreceptor has absorbed the photon. Now that the rhodopsin has actually been stimulated, it cannot respond to another photon until an original shape of the retinal is regained. It does this and replaces the rhodopsin through a three-step process. The first step is going to be bleaching. Bleaching is where it takes the entire rhodopsin molecule and breaks it down into retinol and opsin. Then it goes through reassembly. This is the retinol undergoes the changing shape to the original shape, and the opsin and retinol are reassembled as rhodopsin. This is going to, of course, use ATP. So this is a diagram of the process of bleaching and reassembly of the rhodopsin molecule, which allows us to become sensitive again to light. We do this by taking the modified uh, retinol, removing it, and allows us to reset the opsin. This is the bleaching process. Then we take that retinol with ATP catalyzed by the enzyme retinol dehydrogenase, and it changes the shape back to its original shape. We can then put this back in through the process of reassembly. Now, the visual pathways are a little bit more complicated than we have time to go through. The important thing to understand is that we actually move the information or the light initially from the pigmented epithelial cells to the photoreceptors, to the bipolar cells, and then to the ganglion cells, which will transmit the information to the optic nerve via cranial nerve two. But a few of the things I wanna talk about are how we actually move in the visual pathways. So I'll be brief with this, but the axons from about 1 million ganglion cells are gonna converge at that optic disc. And then that information is going to travel towards the dicephalon as the optic nerve is going to split. The two optic nerves reach the dicephalon at the optic chiasm. This is simply going to be where they meet. 
Then we go through a process of decusation where we uh, cross over at that optic chiasm and then projection where the signals are projected towards the primary visual cortex in the occipital lobe. So in this diagram, we can see where information is actually gathered in the eye, transmitted via the optic nerve, crossing over at the optic chiasm, and then projected finally onto the occipital lobe of the brain. This allows us to have association where images are processed, associated with memories, concepts, and responses. And we won't go into the visual pathways much more than that. That's it for the visual lecture.